Welcome everybody to Hermeneutics Lecture 13. Um, today we're going to begin to bring all of our research together and you know I'm not making this an academic um, exegesis. Um, I want you to first of all I don't want you to be threatened by all the terminology um, so those of you who have studied hermeneutics and exegesis you're going to see differences here now and and the way that I'm presenting this um, and so uh, really important for me to emphasize that I want this to be something that you can use in your notebook um, on an ongoing basis it's not threatening it, however it does demand a, demand a lot of research I want your research to be more directed however um, at the Bible rather than all of the commentaries and all the dictionaries and all the lexicons. We're going to utilize those. You need to utilize those. Um, but it, it always has to be, you know, secondary. You've got to go through this process that I presented to you. And I don't think that that's so much foreign from your standard exegesis model, you know, wherein you, you know, basically you identify, of course, what it is that you want to study. You go through, you create your... Uh, well, you look at comparative text, okay, because that's really very important for everybody to do. You know, look at the King James Version, look at the NIV, look at, you know, the MEV, whatever, you know, it, it's good to have some diversity. Look for variant words, um, perhaps, um, that are there. Uh, there's some questions you might want to ask about those variant words. I personally prefer uh, myself. Uh, the Byzantine text type, the majority text type. However, I do look at the variants in USB 4, which I simply, and I know this is going to upset some of you, I call it the Tischendorf text because my extant manuscript research shows me that there's not a lot of difference between Tischendorf's um, 1850, um, yes, 1859 text that he found um, at, at in the you know the uh, Vatican in the Vatican trash can basically in the library to be nice about it, and and Sinai that it's really not a lot different. There's not a lot of difference, even though yeah, it's it's supposed to be an eclectic text, uh, in which all of the variant text types are analyzed. Um, you know, I, I just have my opinions about a bias that I see there. I don't see the objectivity that ought to be there. I see almost like an offense against the majority text. It's like, you know, liberals always basically being offended about everything conservative, trying to find some new position. And I know, I know that a lot of you don't like what I just said. I'm sorry. Uh, bottom line of it is I want it kept sac sacred. And, um... You know, there's not a lot of variance there anyways that really counts, but in some places, the variance that does appear does count. But having said that, look at your different, you know, translations of the Bible. Make sure that, you know, you feel really comfortable about your most important words, that there isn't really big variance. There shouldn't be big variance when you take the King James Version, get rid of the these and the thous and the shouldest and, the, and uh, you know, those other, you know, antiquated word, you know, uh, word usages, uh, turn them into uh, you and, 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 you know, and he and, and they's and, and, and make, smooth it out just a little bit, just so you're not reading the yeas and these and vows, okay? Um, then it shouldn't really have that much of a difference in its reading from the other comparative texts that you're utilizing. So once you've done that, of course, then you make your list of, of words that you want to research, just as we've done. We took important words like spirit, Holy Spirit, salvation, baptism. I've tried to show you how to utilize, you know, both the English word to search out the verses of scripture that you need. I've also showed you how to use the Greek word to search out the scriptures that uh, you, you want to be able to evaluate. I began to show you how to deal with the issues of verses of scriptures that show up that, um, you know, have some kind of contradictions potentially to them. And um, so all this process is very, very important. Now, what you're going to do also is you're going to begin to, um, you know, as you, as you begin to write 
out in your notes what we would classically call your exegesis, which is going to be your summary of what you've just studied, okay? Um, one of the things that I really like to do that I think is very, very important to do is to classify it to start off with, is this the Old Covenant or is it the New Covenant? And then also let me just say, is it the Interim Covenant? And you've got to kind of be careful with the Interim, but I just want to make the point that until the death of the testator, the covenant is not in effect. So as long as Jesus remained in his body, which was like a veil, okay, there was still no entrance into the new covenant as we now understand it from the day that he was crucified, buried, raised from the dead, ascended up on high, led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men, sent the Holy Ghost. That is the ratification, the establishment of the new covenant. And so there are there are need there's a need to have a general view of, hey, we're in the old covenant, here's what the old covenant is about, here's what it's based on. That had become redundant for you after a while, but it's okay. It's always bringing into perspective the verses of scripture that you're reading. If it's in the Old Testament, you want to classify this. Is this, you know, especially with respect to uh, not only genre, but is it, is it narrative of things that had already happened? Is it past tense? Is it things that are ongoing? Is it present tense? Or are we talking about something that God is describing in the future? And um, so, um, you know, this is just obviously there's more details here. Uh, I'm just giving you an abbreviated understanding of how to go about this. Just some very, you know, general classifications for how you're going to organize your thoughts. And so here we are clearly in the New Covenant. Here we are uh, in a situation where this is the first um, missionary yeah, excursion, an event uh, taking place by the um, disciples. And one of the things that you can do right here is when you're saying, okay, this is the first missionary event to the Gentiles, to the Samaritans, is you want to say, you know, who were the Samaritans? Were there any other kind of events or interactions uh, with the Samaritans um, by and large with Jesus? Where did the Samaritans come from? Okay, those things are actually revealed in the scripture. And some of them, of course, are historic. Uh, but really, you know, the Northern Kingdom, for example, when it went in, when it was, um, uh, went under the judgment of God and what we call the Dispor, they were dispersed by uh, Sennacherib, uh, who was the ruler of the Assyrian Empire. And God used the Assyrians to judge them. Uh, then many of those uh, uh, which we would classically refer to as the Ten Tribes were then exported out of the northern kingdoms and, um, you know, sent to different places that the Bible also describes um, in, in, the, in, the, uh, you know, in the areas of Assyria and north of Assyria. And then there were imported many other nations into the northern kingdom so that there was a mixing of the Israelites, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, that were remaining there ultimately with these uh, nations that were then imported into um, the northern kingdom. And that became the classic area of Samaria or the Samar you know, the Samaritans. Um, and so understanding a little bit of background there and trying to under you know grab a hold of as much information as you can about the Samaritans is valuable. Uh, did Jesus minister to the Samaritans? Yes, he did. And you don't want to disconnect John chapter 4 from the way that you're writing out this summary. After all, Jesus did, though he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, uh, he did go and do um, evangelism and you might say a, a, a missions trip into Samaria 
and mm -hmm. at, at Jacob's well, and there he finds this woman who he clearly identifies as a Samaritan uh, who did not know who uh, she was worshiping um, and made it very clear that she was not Jewish by classic sense of being in the covenant and extended to her the offer of the gift of salvation. And that is a very important passage of scripture to think about and to consider because the way Jesus is talking is though He's talking as though it is available for her right at that moment. He said, you recognize who I am and you recognize the gift that I have for you, which is a gift of salvation. And out of your belly will begin to flow, or rather, there will begin to be a wellspring springing up on the inside of you uh, for this life of God, eternal life, uh, ageless life. Wow. I mean, you know, it just, you, you got to leave that on hold because if we start talking about that, you know, then uh, we're going to get distracted because it's just so beautiful. The, ex you know, the Lord Jesus showing his, how simple salvation is. And so, and, and that's very, very important to what we're doing here. And I, I got to, I cannot overemphasize uh, when you're dealing with things like this, don't get lost in the woods of the details. Look at the bigger picture. Jesus did not die at the cross of Calvary. Go through, God was not incarnated in the flesh, lived the life that he lived, uh, then ultimately, you know, suffered, bleed, and died for us, go down into hell, raise up the third day to give us ritual. <laughs> That would be terrible. I watch how so many people take and just go off into left field because they're not looking at the big picture. You know, let's understand this. This is the new covenant. It's been ratified. It's the simplicity of what Jesus said to the woman at Samaria. So Samaria has already been addressed. It is the simplicity of the offer of God to uh, to for salvation for all. He's long-suffering. He's not willing that anyone perish, but that everyone come to the knowledge of salvation. Praise God. Isn't Father amazing? Huh? And he's made it on the basis of whosoever will, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And, and make salvation, you know, uh, uh, as simple as it's supposed to be within the perspective of everything that Jesus did, as Paul talks about in first Corinthians chapter one, as we've dealt with a little bit of that message there, that it's all about the cross of Christ. That's the power and the wisdom of God. That is the power of salvation, foolishness to the Greeks, stumbling block to the Jews, but to us that believe it is the power of of salvation. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men can be saved. So understand, let's look always at the big picture of how salvation comes. Let's always put in our in our summary the big picture of, of those things that belong to the new birth and always equating the new birth. I, I've watched people get lost in the woods, if you would, just on the issue of faith and, and Paul's um, you know, thesis on uh, justification by faith. And they forget that faith is faith is faith in the new covenant, that faith in the new covenant is all about being born again, being made a new creation, being born of the spirit, being born of the seed of the word of God, which sometimes is also so, you know, uh, symbolized by water. And so, you know, you know, I, I really didn't deal a lot with that versus that passage of scripture in John chapter three and verses three through six. It's very, very good to, to deal with and understand all of the symbolisms of water from the Old Testament perspective, speaking of the things that would, would, would come. Understand Jesus' symbolism of water. Jesus is more talking about the water as it relates to the Holy Spirit uh, and the spirit, uh, the life of God on the inside of us, uh, that salvation he likens unto it, uh, likes it, likens it unto a drink uh, uh, of water that then becomes uh, a wellspring on the inside of us or a river on the inside of us. He's not just talking about the baptism of waters. Okay, very very important. I, I think the so. It's so easy to get tripped up and isolate verses of scripture 
and and not properly deal with them. So, you know, once again, what you're doing now, uh, every one of you that are in this class, you are now going to start writing out your summary or your exegesis. And I pray that you'll always do this and that you'll, you know, after 10 years, you know, you'll have a, you know, multiple notebooks. And then all that's always going to be valuable to you because, you know, let's just say that you don't come back to really begin to study this particular verse of Scripture several years from now. Well, when you do come back, you can consult your notes and you'll go, wow, I've grown so much. There will be so much more for you to add here because you'll have a bigger picture of, of the whole of Scripture. Once again, it's always letting Scripture interpret Scripture. It's always understanding what God is saying in the context of the community in which he's speaking. All of these things are very important. Is it Old Covenant? Is it Interim Covenant? Is it the New Covenant? And, and then really then dealing with, you know, even sometimes the subtleties of a verse of Scripture. There's like one word in here that we didn't deal with, a real subtle word, monos, um, which is only or simply, you know, uh, in verse 16, they had not, you know, they had, you see, um, just so that I, that I uh, quote this right, let me go ahead and <laughs> uh, open up my Bible here and, um, and, and read this here. It says, but as, uh, let's see, but as, as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only, only, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So as of yet, the Holy Spirit uh, put that word in from verse 15, um, had not fallen upon any of them only, or a particular Greek word, which is simply singular monos, which it also could be translated um, simply, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, really kind of in a subtle way, uh, bringing out that, wait a minute, you know, the whole package hasn't been delivered yet. They'd only been baptized in water, but that wonderful event of baptism in the Holy Ghost, which is really what it's all about, because this is about a relationship with God. This is about a radical change where we become God's purchased possession. We become the inhabitants of the Lord. Um, and so, yeah, um, praise God. You know, I got I get inspired with so many things to say when I get when I get into this. It's hard for me to keep on track <laughs> with respect to to what we're doing from kind of a you know a, an analytical point of view. And, and I don't like to overanalyze, and I don't want to make you know God's word a a you know a you know a uh, collection of data points. Okay, but however, it is in some respects. Because there is so much said on this vast subject of God's love and this amazing, unspeakable gift of intimacy and relationship with Him that we've got to take in the collection of all the information because many times what we'll discover is the Lord is saying the same thing over and again in many different ways. And that if we'll just always remember that the Bible is a book of redemption and God's love for all of humanity, not some of humanity, it really helps us to keep our perspective that Jesus didn't die to give us more ritual. He died to give us a relationship. He died and rose again and poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we could enter into this realm of union and have a complete restoration back to all that was lost and beyond what was lost when Adam chose to walk away from God. I mean, you know... I love the way that 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 Paul says it in Titus three five. You know we're saved by the washing of the water of regeneration. I mean being as it like regene. I mean a whole new birth, a whole new genealogy. I mean God is our Father. I mean you talk about 
understanding this in the perspective of a new race instead of a bunch of people who are still imprisoned with a problem, hoping that someday they will be delivered. We're not sitting around spiritually in Egypt waiting for the deliverer to come. Praise God, someone more faithful than Moses was, someone more powerful than Moses was, something so far greater has now taken place. Christ Jesus, God incarnated in the flesh, has come and delivered us out of the slavery and the bondage and the tyranny of spirit spiritual Egypt of misery, Mitzrayim, you know, which is the Hebrew word for, uh, for uh, Egypt. And I, and it, I, I love to play on words, you know, and say misery, not just Mitzrayim, but misery. Okay. Praise the Lord for these things. Not, not ritual. Okay. Once again, not ritual. God didn't, didn't, didn't do all that he did for us so that we could try to come up with a ritualistic formula and, you know, interact with them from afar and try to have, you know, all these various different forms and types and literatures. Okay. Well, let's just look at this summary, you know, and that is the law of interpretation of scripture is fundamentally, come on, you've got to let scripture interpret scripture that you're going to get a lot of it now, as I said, just by understanding how to take your words, do your word study, do your comparative text study, okay? Um, looking at the same similar events that happen in different places as we have done, you know, the similar event of Pentecost that took place in Jerusalem with 120. Now it's the Samaritan, what could be classically understood as the Samaritan's Pentecost and the first missions trip of the disciples compared to the Pentecost. You could just say even on an individual basis, even though it's a light, slightly different, we've gone now from community, it's, we've gone from community at Jerusalem, the, the initial Pentecost, community at Samaria, okay, now we can go and look at an individual Pentecost, if you would, with with Saul as he uh, experiences the wonderful works of salvation uh, through Christ Jesus personally, and also the ministry of Ananias in um, in uh, Acts chapter nine. Then we go look at another community. We jump to another community. There's more to evaluate. We didn't evaluate all of the events, okay, that took place. Just some of them. You know, uh, like in Acts 16, we looked at the, uh, you know, a snapshot of what took place in a household um, uh, there uh, when Paul was imprisoned. And then we go on, we jump to the community there at uh, Cornelius' house, and we watch as that community also has a Pentecost as the, um, as, as the Holy Ghost is poured out upon them. Uh, once again, through Peter's ministry, then we go ahead and and we move on to a, another community, uh, which is there in Acts chapter 19, and this is Paul's ministry, and, you know, we want to collect all of those things, and we want to understand, you know, that in some places, there was nobody laying any hands on anyone, it was a rushing mighty wind at the initial event, you know, when the Holy Ghost, the gift of God was given, Understanding those things in your summary, putting those together. So all of this is important, okay? Um, so that's why we did the word studies that we did. And you want to create these kinds of conclusions. You don't want to just take my uh, wording and begin to write out your conclusions or your summary or your exegesis, nor do you want to do that with commentaries. You don't want to do that. You want to begin to summarize in your own words. And if you'll just stand back and, and just start, maybe even just start dialoguing and talking to others. And that's why, you know, those who are in the class, I want you to break out into smaller groups, uh, you know, at least two. And I want you to just begin to talk about the meaning of these things um, in your notes. So you can look over your notes and then begin to talk about the meaning of what you've been reading and what you, the information you've been collecting. Because many times as we just talk about it to someone else, you know, it's like the creative flow is there a little bit better rather than having a pencil in your hand, staring at a piece of paper or, you know, sitting before a computer going, oh, no, how do I collect this information? It's difficult sometimes to talk to yourself. OK, so, you know, break it out like that. Um, and so um, what was I saying? Oh, yes. Yeah, so you've dealt with the community. You've dealt with reality of, oh, well, how does the gift of the Holy Ghost come? Well, it came by, you know, the Holy Spirit uh, descending upon them in just simple obedience, waiting uh, under the uh, leadership and direction of the Lord Jesus Christ in the upper room. And then we see the gift of the Holy Ghost coming 
and being poured out on the Samaritan community by the laying on of hands. What's the uniqueness there? Is there something else that the text is saying to us? I will tell you, yes, there is, but it's not part of our questions. And so, you know, there's a lot of questions you can ask of the text and they kind of fall out obviously because you're going, why, why, you know, is that important? Or, and if you're not careful, you'll go, oh my goodness, the only way that you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost and receive, you know, this wonderful work where the Holy Spirit will fall upon you as if you have an apostle come and lay hands on you. Well, if you did that, then, you know, and you just isolated that, um, you know, pericope, that passage there, and, and that was your conclusion or summary and isolation of all other things, obviously you're going to end up with the wrong conclusion. And I'm emphasizing this because it's simple for you maybe to hear that now, but reality of it is you might not have heard that as simply at the beginning uh, when we first started these lectures. Um, and it's the same case with the rest of Scripture. Don't try to understand Scripture in isolation of itself. There is so much to bring in to view here. Because then, of course, you know, when you go on to the community of Cornelius' house, Peter didn't lay hands on them. He's just preaching. You know, he's just declaring the word of God. I mean, that's the power of the gospel. All you and I have got to do is just declare the word of God, stand back and watch the Holy Ghost go to work. I mean, we try too hard, okay? Yeah, just declare the word and let God, the Holy Ghost, do the work. And so, and then, you know, um, you, you can say, well, uh, maybe you have some conclusions there that you would stop at. and But don't, you know, don't stop there. Look at all the communities. Go, go. And once again, as I said, Acts chapter 19, you're going to see now, it's not Peter, it's Paul. He's not one of the original, you know, apostles, and obviously. And so then it doesn't stop there because this gift of the Holy Ghost has already been defined. That is for us, for our children, for our children's children. So said Peter, you know, unto every generation, as many as the Lord should call. Is the Lord still calling? Yes, he is. Obviously, he's still calling. We're right still in the context today of the new covenant. That's what links us to everything in the scripture and all the events of the scripture. All the events of the scripture are seating us for what God wants to do in our life right now. It's seating us with an expectation. It's seating us with a faith for all that God would do in our life right now. All the things that are in the scripture are a foundation for us to understand this is what God has for us. What connects us specifically with that is the new covenant. We are in that time period. There is nothing changed. The increase of his government, there is no end. In fact, it's increased. It's even more powerful from that perspective than it was then. So that's why we don't want to lose our connection. We don't want to somehow make ourselves unique in the 21st century because I'm going to tell you right now, God's in the future way off in the future. He's far more futuristic than we are now. And so as you deal with this, many of those things that would somehow come up as, you know, supposed answers that opposes us in receiving all that God has freely given and supplied in the new covenant is entirely invalidated. This is all for us now it, because we're living in the new covenant. Jesus paid the price for the new covenant. What is the new covenant made of? Here it is in simple form laid out for us in the book of Acts as a pattern, as a set pattern to give to us a full um, disclosure, if you would, of all that is available to us. And, you know, when you try to start writing ritual around it, you're not going to be able to. Did Paul lay hands on them in, in, in the community in Ephesians chapter 19? Yes, he did. Okay, so, but, you know, we you could say that we have two instances of Pentecost that came without the laying on of hands <laughs> with the original Pentecost, Acts chapter 2 and um, Acts chapter 10. And then we have two instances of Pentecost that came by the laying on of hands, okay, <laughs> which would be Samaria and then Exodus chapter 19, the community of the disciples that Paul encountered at Ephesus. What is your conclusion? Well, your conclusion has to be it can that, that the outpouring of the Holy Ghost can come, you know, by uh, you know simply the preaching of the Word uh, and, and and the initiative of God the Holy Ghost, as it were, without the laying on of hands. And it comes also 
by the ministry of the laying on of hands. And so you can't make it one or the other. And you'll find this, you know, does baptism always have, water baptism have to always proceed, baptism in the Holy Ghost? No, it doesn't. You're not going to be able to confine it that way. The wind blows wherever he wills, okay? The Holy Ghost is going to do it his way. You're not going, one of the things that you should walk away from here is that you're not going to confine God to a ritual and to a formula. Are there going to be essential and necessary things for this? to be a, for these consequences and these results and these sequence of events to happen? Absolutely. What is the fundamental, most common, most important thing then? And that that is the initiative event, initiating event. What is that? Christ Jesus dying at Calvary. God manifested in the flesh to be the sacrifice, the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. So that has got to be our central point. Jesus has to be our central point of salvation. That's one of the important things about salvation that you saw as you drew out um, your conclusions after having looked up all the words on salvation. Jesus' very name means salvation, okay? And so he is the central figure of all that salvation is. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men can be saved than this wonderful name of Jesus. It's the authority of the name. It's the authority of the blood. What is it all about? It's all about you and I being born of the Holy Spirit, being born again, being made a new creation, being reconciled unto God, being justified or made righteous. These are the central points that you want to always keep before you because they're the cardinal important issues, the cardinal points of salvation and what the faith of the new covenant is all about, what the new covenant is all about. So maybe over and again, you have to define for yourself, hey, wait a minute, I'm in the new covenant. From an exegetical point of view, I think that that is more important than genre. Although genre is very important, you know, is it a parable? You know, is it a hymn? All these things are good and wonderful, but something is bigger than that. And that is, what is the definite definition of the new covenant? What is the new covenant all about? What is faith really all about? What is, how is faith defined? What is the faith of the new covenant? The faith of the new covenant is being washed in the blood, born of the spirit, made a new creation. That has to have preeminence over everything and it has to be the means by which then we understand all scripture in view of this glorious and most important work of grace. Don't take grace and define it differently. Don't take faith and define it differently. Don't take the activity of the Holy Spirit and define it differently. Define it in the context of the new covenant. Okay. Don't try to define it in the context of the old covenant. Don't try to define it in the context of an interim covenant unless that is exactly where you find yourself. Okay. Good. Okay. So, you know, um, once again, I can't overemphasize the danger of preconceived ideas, which at, at you know obscure obscure the actual meaning. You're going to have to always be challenging yourself. When you're running up a verse of scripture that doesn't agree with what you already believe, you're going to have to be willing to let the Holy Spirit lead you. One of the things that you just do is acknowledge God, the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, help me. I, 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 I really believe that this is what this means, but... Here I am faced right now with something that is leading me in another direction. Help me to see. And then you don't just go down on your knees and stay on your knees. You open up the Bible and you begin to study because that's what the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, is how he's going to speak to you in, in, in the most accurate and verifiable way. Okay? So, um, you know, once again, the definition of words you know, is so important and going after the definition of words fundamentally uh, from the Bible. And then as you grow and as you mature, let me just challenge you guys. Listen, you know, um, the Greek language does help us to understand um, archaic or elusive Hebrew words. And so when we can utilize the Septuagint, uh, Greek Septuagint, and then make a bridge between the Greek Septuagint, which Old Testament Greek, second century Greek, with the Hebrew as they understood it in the second century BC. And then we can actually then come and apply that to the New Testament. And that helps. But, you know, you don't have to be able to have that kind of a skill set. It just helps. And it, it will develop you and mature you. And so the bottom line of it is, 
you know, the way that that Greek words are used in the New Testament are more important to us than the way that they're used in a dictionary and how you define them. However, you want to use the dictionary because at the same time, there are many uh, people out there, uh, scholars, uh, and that have really devoted themselves to really getting at accurate information. You know, I, I love to use the word agape. Um, you understand that word from a New Testament point of view more perfectly than you'll ever understand it from Attic Greek or from Koine Greek. And so we've got to understand, wait, this is this is more than a like. This is a love, and this is a love on a level that is divine love, and it points to us something that really then, you know, says this is the love that God has shown to us and extended towards us. This is just any kind of love. So, you know, I can't overemphasize that. Remember, you know, the examination of many different reference books and commentaries is very, very important, but you cannot have an over-reliance upon them because of denominational bias that can easily be brought in there. you got to watch out for this fight against Calvinism versus Armenianism. Try to sidestep at Pentecostalism, you know, versus, you know, just fundamentalism. You know, you've got to try to sidestep that. Let's go after the word. Let's get after the fight. If you're in any kind of strife, if you're using the word of God in any other kind of way for some kind of personal gain, you're never going to end up in the right place. I mean, the word of God is something so sacred, so holy, so wonderful that if you begin to involve yourself in those things that belong to the realms of the demonic like strife, you're never going to hear the Holy Ghost speak. So just shut that stuff down. And I'm going to tell you right now, as far as I'm concerned, Although people have not emphasized this in exegesis, I'm telling you, it is absolutely essential. As far as I'm concerned, it's more important than any, uh, well, many of these other, you know, um, uh, rules and sensitivities to, to different things that, you know, maybe I'll, I'll still have a little bit of time to talk about. You know, take all of your conclusions, once again, the conclusions that we've given on the Holy Spirit, the conclusions that we've given on salvation, you know, refer to the Greek words that you studied, you know, maybe refer to some, you know, nuances or uniqueness of, of how those Greek words maybe um, gave you something a little bit more um, than what you would have gotten if you would have just used an English word. And, uh, you know, uh, then then go ahead and, and begin to consult commentaries also um, with respect to this passage of Scripture. And, you know, maybe all that you have available to you is the freeware that's out there. And maybe some of the real old commentaries like Clark and Gill and others, you don't have Lang and, you know, many of, uh, you know, um, um, many of the newer commentaries, uh, but nonetheless, utilize what you have. Don't over-rely on them. Don't just quote what they're saying. Listen to what they're saying. Stand back from it and and let it let God the Holy Spirit speak to you as you're reading these commentaries. Let those things that really stand out as, wow, that does, you know, um, really help me piece together some of the of the information and fill in some of the blanks well then didn't go with that um because as you're writing out your thoughts here you know it's going to help you maybe well it's definitely going to help you then to begin to deal with more of the rules are you creating a contradiction by what you're getting ready to say once again you've got to always be reevaluating. you've evaluated as you've gathered your information you know these important rules of not violating the context you know, making sure that there are two or three verses of scripture on everything that you're saying um, or that you're concluding. Now that conclusion is now coming into a summary form. You still want to be able to utilize these things, letting scripture interpret scripture. Um, okay, not creating contradictions. If there's anything that kind of creates a contradiction, you can't say, oh, there's contradictions in the Bible. No. There aren't. They're not contradictions in the Bible. Now, I know that some of you don't like that. That's too bad. They're not contradictions in the Bible. Every Everything that is seemingly contrad a contradiction can be explained, okay? Come on, okay? And, and it's not something that's subjective either. So, you know, and, and at any time, anybody wants to um, argue that point with me uh, or get information to, um, from me to justify that statement, you know, I stand ready to um, to do that, okay? So, you know, once again, you know, when you're looking at classical exegetical 
you know, formats of how you lay out your exegesis, you're going to be looking at literary form and genre. Fine. Don't forget what covenant you're in. Don't, uh, don't underestimate the value and the importance of what really is the theme and the bigger and the larger context, okay? <laughs> the larger context of redemption, the longer, larger context of how salvation comes, okay? Because if you don't, if you're not sensitive to this, then what's going to happen is you're going to go off in, in, in a place where you're truly lost in the woods. And unfortunately, there aren't a lot of exegetical formats that over, that emphasize this enough. It's just like, you know, it, it goes to a, a more of a, a microcosm of this. It's a, you know, a subheading, a sub subheading of what really ought to be emphasized first. Okay. So, you know, once again, you, you got to deal with, with uh, your grammar and you got to deal with your syntax and sometimes it's more difficult than others because, <laughs> my goodness, when you try to deal with syntax in Titus, or forgive me, in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and some of you really understand what I mean, in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, ah, it gets difficult, okay? Um, and, and because some things are said in ways that you just like, wait a minute, you know, uh, whoever the audience was, they already fully understood this information and so it's being said almost in a you know in a slang and in a way in which that uh, the audience is already fully aware of what's getting ready to be said and so it was said in an abbreviated manner sometimes it gets difficult and so once again you know it, it's it's the importance of letting scripture you know, interpret scripture. Okay, so we've done our we've done our research. We, we and, and and we've done a certain amount of synthesis because we've done our, our summaries and our conclusions on each one of the words that we study, the word groups that we studied. And so, you know, how do we write this paper? How how do you begin to write this paper? And hopefully I've laid it out there that how you do this, okay? And how you begin to make a summary of all that you have been summarizing. And, um, you know, um, once again, I think that talking about it among yourselves definitely, you know, has, has a great value in, in terms of how you're going to write this paper, because this is what I'm, this is what I'm holding you responsible for, you know, and there's, there's some things too, to, to really avoid, you know, you, you're not writing a sermon. This is not, um, a homiletics. You're not writing a homily here. You don't want to be, you want to be getting at you know, the, the value of what's being said um, in the passage of Scripture that, that you're reading and or the pericope that you're dealing with. Um, and it's so easy to start sermonizing rather than just dealing with, uh, with, with the facts, with the truth. Um, you know, I, I've watched even older ministers just basically take verses of Scripture and just line them up and says, you know, and it's just basically presented almost as it were in a disconnected form. And I'm supposed to now understand that this is the explanation for the verse of Scripture because I'm going to look at all these other verses of Scripture. Well, I understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to utilize all the verses of Scripture that bring a support to understanding what this verse of Scripture means. But however, they need to connect the dots. You need to connect the dots. You know, maybe that you know, and some of these older men of God that I'm talking about or older students of the Word that I'm talking about, I don't have any doubt that if I could get them to talk that they really knew how to connect the verses of Scripture in such a way that it was a complete explanation of what they were trying to say. However, they just didn't practice it. So it's not good enough just to say, okay, you know, here's what the Scripture says about salvation and just quote, reference all these verses of Scripture. No, 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 no. Okay, so you've got to be able to walk us through this and say, okay, and here's another scripture that supports this this conclusion of, of this is what we what we have concluded that here's how simple salvation it, it is. Here we see it, as, it presented this way. Here we see it presented uh, in this other way. But in but really in reality they're saying exactly the same thing. That it's just this easy. We saw very clearly, you know, that um, salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit. We saw that um, how easy it is to be saved and that, you know, once you call upon the name of the Lord, you're saved and, and then helping us to understand this in light of uh, 
the passage of scripture that we're that we're studying right now and once again the conclusion of my goodness you know you're baptized in water uh, in an obedience to the covenant and answering of a good conscience before the lord and and then that helps us to then seal the deal you know it's a done deal with the samaritans they are saved saved wonderfully saved and then you know <laughs> you know it's important to go ahead and draw out that the reality of why it is so so important to bring up Simon because he's the only one who wasn't saved and so anybody who wasn't saved in that community in that group now was isolated by the outpouring of the gift of the Holy Ghost when the Holy Spirit was had fallen Every, evidently as you can see the Holy Ghost had fallen on everyone my goodness look at how close Simon was to all of this it was like he was carrying um, Philip's suitcase around, so to speak. I mean, he was there watching Philip right there with them. You know, he had called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. He had been baptized in water. But there was something wrong. There was not an honest and sincere heart. So there's information given in Acts chapter 8 in the whole of the chapter, not just in the pericope, that is valid and important for your summaries here, okay? because of the evidence that is now given, once again, underscored with the eunuch. Do you believe with all your heart? Obviously, uh, Simon did it. Obviously, the rest of the community did. What was wrong with Simon? What was going on with him? What was the false motives? Where where was the breakdown in the simplicity of, this, of salvation being brought to him? You know, some people get off into... A misunderstanding of predestination and foreordination and election because they haven't dealt with all of the scriptures in the context of the new covenant and the grace of God and how far it reaches and how far it extends because they're just locked down on a particular view of what those words mean carried away too much with dictionary and lexicon definitions rather than the context and when I'm talking about context, I'm not just talking about context of the actual passage or pericope uh, or, or, you know, or section or segment or, or chapter or book. I'm talking about the covenant. I'm talking about the bigger, the larger context. I've got to understand all these words and the, and the larger context. I've got to make sure that I am not creating co uh, contradictions in the larger context of the new covenant, not just in the immediate context. In the larger context, in their bigger view, you know, uh, it's like some people say, don't major on the minors. Exactly. Don't major on the minors. Don't just sit there and just try to understand the whole of the new covenant and in light of what that one passage of scripture is saying. Back away. <laughs> look at the bigger context. God, look at the most important cardinal issues here. God was manifested in the flesh. God was incarnated into a human form to be our Savior, to bleed and die, to take our sins upon himself for the sins of the, a few people, whole world. Look at the bigger context of grace. Look at the bigger context of salvation because you can't then create for yourself um, a contradiction by not, uh, by observing Local context, let me put it that way, at the expense of not observing global context, the whole of the covenant. So I, I hope this is helping you. I hope this makes sense to you um, and that you will be able to, to grab a hold of these wonderful things in Jesus. Yeah, let me real quickly just give you um, one example of a commentary uh, that you would, uh, you know, potentially uh, review here as you're writing your conclusions. Because, you know, as you begin to read what other people have written, sometimes it really, once again, inspires uh, that that creative thought, that flow. Um, helps you hook up with how, how to write something. And let me use a commentary that uh, pretty much a, a, is is available to everyone. Would be Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. Okay, it would be a commentary on the critical and explanatory of the whole. Uh, it's a, it's a commentary, critical and explanatory uh, of, of the whole Bible. Once again, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. Um, 
I think a lot of that commentary would be available to you online. And let's just let's just look at, for example, uh, what what they would cite. Um, I'm going to give something that they would cite from Pole Hill, J J B Pole Hill, and um, on the Book of Acts, something that Pole Hill wrote in 1992. And of course, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, they'll do a collection in their a summarization of a passage of scripture. They'll do a collection of what other people have said about this. And once again, I, I, I want to emphasize that the value of that, it's just that you have to be guarded. So let me read this to you. So the current passage is the most difficult case of them all. Why was the, re, why was the rece, reception of the Spirit so disconnected uh, from, uh, from the Samaritans' baptism? Big question. Why was the Holy Ghost falling upon them? And, of course, they say reception of the Spirit because, once again, I'm not sure that they are going to go ahead and recognize the difference between receiving the Spirit of salvation. I'm, I, they will in certain instances, but in this instance, I'm not sure that they would be. I would have to study out a little bit more about their comments on this, uh, the reception of, of the Holy Spirit as salvation and the reception uh, uh, for, for salvation and the empowerment of the Holy Ghost, which we've already, you know, laid out those separations and those differences um, uh, in our summaries. And so it's important to hang on to what we've got. Don't lose what we got while we're listening to what somebody's saying. Okay, that's important. Um, Luke indicated that such a separation was not normal uh, by the little word simply. And, of course, they're saying Luke because Luke is the one who is uh, ascribed to writing um, out the book of Acts. Um, so they had simply been baptized. One would usually have expected them to have received the Spirit as well. Well, they did receive the Spirit because we know that they received the Spirit. Okay, It's just that the Pentecost baptismal uh, empowerment of the Holy Ghost had not yet fallen upon them. They had simply been baptized. One would usually have ex expected them to have received the Spirit as well. Many interpreters point to the significance of the experience being one of an outward demonstration of the Spirit in more visible signs that Simon could see. And that is true. So there, there was visible signs, and that's the subtleties and the indication of the Scripture that need to be pointed out and cannot be disregarded. It is amazing how many things are disregarded within the context of a local pericope that seem to be, uh, 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 you know, willingly ignored and that bring more value and support to what the global context has already revealed to us about the events that are taking place. And those global uh, events would be those things that, you know, clearly Jesus said to the disciples. There's no question that the 120 were saved. My goodness, the covenant had already been ratified. They were front and center to salvation. Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Spirit before he, you know, ascended up on high. Before that, you know, um, the, those those 10 days of tearing, uh, you want to call it that, even began. And so you've already got some of that in your summary. So let's not lose sight of those things that are clearly pointing to a, a, an indication to us as uh, uh, um, Poe Hill is bringing out here and, and having to honestly deal with, wait a minute, there's something, there's an outward demonstration, there's something visible going on here. It's more than just the inward work of grace. Therefore, this, and I'm going on now reading, therefore, this does not rule out the spirits having worked inwardly in them at the point of their initial conviction and commitment. So good. They're going where they should be going with this because to not consider that as a reality is to ignore a lot of scripture. Certainly they born of the spirit. Certainly they're born again. They follow the simple rules, if you would, the simple request of God. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Okay, come on. Yes, the Lord commissioned us. Those that believe and are baptized, the same will be saved. But yet at the same time, it is the simple power and the authority of the name of Jesus, not water baptism. Water baptism is simple and obedient to, to a, a sacrament that recognizes we have been baptized into his death. We are now part of the covenant. We've been, we're obeying God all the way here. So many more things to say. You have them in your, 
summaries and your conclusions. This is how you know you're now writing these things out now as a general over uh, a general summary, a complete and total collection of all of the information. So. Interpreters also have noted that it was not an individual as much as a community experience when the Spirit fell on them as an outward demonstration of power, okay, much as it had been at Pentecost. Fine, and that's really, you know, a very important point. I mean, God the Holy Ghost is truly bearing witness of them that they are genuinely saved because they've also received the gift of the Holy Ghost, an argument similar to what now Peter is presenting um, to the apostles to the the leadership at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 11 concerning Cornelius's house and much as it would later with Cornelius and his uh, fellow gentiles okay so uh, the, you know they're doing they're processing okay polio is processing pretty much just like we're processing isn't that good it's good because i didn't go and consult polio or Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown before I started writing my conclusions. I'm just letting those things that we have summarized lead us in the right direction. And so you can see the same thing going on here. And, and that's very, it's, it's, it's a very good feeling. It's wonderful when you're reading commentaries and they're, and they're basically not presenting more contradictions uh, for us. But many times they'll present challenges for us as well to say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Is that a contradiction or is that a challenge? Did I leave something out? Oh, I never thought of that. That's why consulting commentaries is very important. It is not without justification that many refer to this as the Samaritan Pentecost. Very, very good. Okay, praise God. Now, I did take a note. I did, you know, I know that that is something that um, is, is, is more common. Okay, so... Oh, let me also say this. I mean, if you've come up with a new idea, you are wrong. <laughs> and I could say you're probably wrong. Well, you are wrong, okay? Because, look, there's too many eyes been looking at this. There's too much goodness in, uh, of God and grace of the Holy Ghost at work in our lives for somebody to individually sit down and read the verse of Scripture and see something that no one else has ever seen, okay? So... <laughs> You know, uh, please always use that as a checks and balance for yourself. Oh, I've got a new revelation. Uh, probably not. Okay. It is a major stage of salvation history. And once again, quoting from Paul, Paul Hill. Um, the spirit is, as it were, indicated in a visible manifestation, the divine approval of the new missionary steps beyond Judaism. Okay. Well, that's good. And go through all the commentaries that you have available to you. There are so many. I mean, goodness gracious. Worth your investment. Uh, if you don't, if you've not made an investment into a Bible software program, uh, someone was talking to me about the vastness of their library the other day. I said, well, my library is huge. I mean, I've got so many different um, electronic programs. Uh, Logos is my favorite. And, you know, I ought to be getting paid something by them. <laughs> no, just kidding. I've used it since, I don't know, probably since they first came out. I don't know when it was. Was it the late 80s? Uh, the early uh, editions and some of the things about the early editions I like better than the way they've done it now. Of course, they made it more user friendly to everybody, but and they've expanded it and it's good. And I've got a lot of other programs too that I use. BLB is a freeware. Yeah, it's a good program and I and I use it. You know, you have to, you know, just live with older commentaries, but there's nothing wrong with that. It's good. You have limited dictionaries, but, you know, still very, very valuable. Listen, we love all of you. We bless you in the name of Jesus.